think about it. If you had two different forms of money and one of them had all these rules on how you could use it and the other one didn't have any rules, you knew it was just, it was a dollar's worth, a dollar's worth, a dollar. Which one are you going to pick? Right. You're going to pick the one without the rules. <laughs> Neha, you are the director of the Digital Currency Initiative at MIT Media Lab, and it's so great to see you again. Welcome. Thank you so much, Jimmy. It's great to be here. Now, we've spoken before, and the last time we were speaking, you were really dividing your time up uh, quite equally between um, digital, uh, well, cryptocurrencies and also central bank digital currencies. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm interested if that's still how you're dividing up your time, and maybe you could talk a little bit about the stuff you've been working on more recently. So that is still how we're dividing our time. Uh, we think both are equally important in the evolution of money and how money is developing and value is moving over the internet. Uh, I guess the most exciting thing that's happened since we last spoke is we actually released the work that we had been working on with the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston in February. So we had been working with them for about a year on uh, the technology research and development behind a hypothetical central bank digital currency that could operate at the scale of an economy the size of the United States. And so in February of uh, 2022, this year, we actually released the paper and an open source code base to the world. Uh, and I'm quite excited about it because I think it's the first time that the Federal Reserve System has ever released open source code. Wow. So are we a step closer to a digital dollar? You know, I, I think I think that's accurate to say that we are a step closer, um, but I think that there's still probably many steps between here and there, uh, and I don't know how that's going to go and how that's going to develop. I mean, one thing I want to be very clear about is that I'm not sure it's the right step for the United States yet, mm -hmm. uh, but what absolutely is the right step is researching and understanding it and working on the technology and trying to figure it out, and that's what we're doing. Because um, the last time we spoke, I remember um, we had some discussion about urgency and which countries around the world are trying to get a digital uh, currency for their, for their country faster than others. And I, I know China uh, uh, were very uh, fast to move. I think Ecuador basically released it, but I'm not sure how well it did. Um, so is there still this sense of urgency from some of these countries in the United States? Or do you think people are a bit more relaxed about taking their time? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think the sense of urgency is still there. So Nigeria released a digital currency. Um, and then, of course, the Bahamas had released one. And the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank had uh, has done one as well. Mm. And China is just very close. Um, so we've definitely seen an uptick in research and development and an uptick in release. Uh, but we're also seeing a lot of other countries do different types of development. So Brazil, for example, has a system called PIX, which is not exactly a central bank digital currency, but is more about an interoperable platform that banks plug into. Mm -hmm. And it has gotten very popular in Brazil. Uh, people are making a lot of transactions using PIX. It's kind of like imagine if there was a version of something like Venmo, but it worked for everybody. You didn't right. have to be a, just a Venmo user, you know, no matter what app you were using, you could you could pay other people. So, um, yeah, so we're seeing countries, you know, still working, uh, still developing. Central banks move at their own pace. Sure. Uh, and I think we're kind of waiting to see and gather data from the countries that have already launched. So on, um, on digital currencies in particular, I'm interested about the sort of more specific practicalities of it. Um, how specific can governments be, whether it's in terms of taxation or whether it's like a fiscal stimulus check? Are they able to sort of stamp some of these, uh, some of the, the, the checks that they send and say this can only be spent in this certain way and uh, we can now see bank accounts more easily, therefore we can tax more specifically? Um, can you talk a bit about sort of the pros and cons of a digital currency from the perspective of government control? Absolutely. So this is something that I am very concerned about. And a lot of people are quite rightly concerned about because when you make it really easy to issue digital currency, well, then, you know, you, you make it easier for people to issue it, uh, you know, to certain people. And the programmable nature of digital currency makes it so that you can do things like what you said, which is perhaps restrict use and say mm. you can only use it for food or you can you can't use it for this or for that. Um, I think that that's a that's a very dangerous step for a country to take. I'm not sure it's a step that we want to take in the United States anytime soon. Uh, we actually think about the technology behind digital currencies. Part of it is not just about enabling that kind of use, but also thinking about what safeguards do we want to put in the technology so it might be the case 
that you can't restrict how it's used? How can we actually build the technology so that um, the money has more freedom and right. more expressivity um, instead of being limited in what you can do with it? So I think that that is definitely a concern. Um, and you know, it's something that we are, we are very careful about and we wanna make sure the issue is known and people talk about it and uh, policymakers are aware of it uh, and don't you know, deploy something like that too, in, in too lightly. So when you say um, you have these concerns about it, is it more of a social issue that the government shouldn't be telling people how they should be spending their money? Yeah, well, mm. I, mean, I think there's the policy aspect of it and there's the technology aspect right. of it. Right, you don't right? know if they can physically be able to do that. The technology isn't there yet, or is that not what you're saying? So the te I think the technology is there. I oh think the technology God. could be built in such a way to do this, but I think from a, you know, it's really a policy question. Do governments want to do this? Mm. And I think, you know, my opinion is once you look at what it would mean and how it would work, the answer is probably no. You don't want to start restricting the way money can be used like that. It makes it less effective as money. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes people less trustworthy of it. And it means that people will um, will decide to use other instruments for right. money and transactions instead of the money. You know, think about it. If you had two different forms of money and one of them had all these rules on how you could use it and the other one didn't have any rules, you knew it was just, it was a dollar's worth of dollars worth of dollar, which one are you going to pick? Right. You're going to pick the one without the rules, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and Unless you're in a society, a society, you know, really totalitarian society, or one with a dictator, or something like that, it's probably, you know, you're probably going to have the option to choose, and people are going to choose the one without the rules. And currencies compete in the world, mm. uh, you know, as, as we become more and more global. And so it's probably not a good idea to create money that has a lot of restrictions on it, even if you can. Uh, it's just going to be less effective as money. Yeah, um, and I remember the last time we spoke. Um, uh, one of the challenges we were talking about was not from other countries uh, maybe getting there first, but some of the big tech companies like Facebook with their, with their currency, DM. Um, now, uh, what I guess I hadn't really thought about before is that if a currency is uh, initiating a digital currency, you're talking tens of millions or hundreds of millions, but Facebook has access to three billion people straight away. So that would, pre that would present a, an immediate challenge to a digital currency. So do you know sort of what's the latest from Meta in terms of developing their own currency? So it's actually really interesting you bring that up. Since we last spoke, uh, Meta has shuttered the Diem project. So they actually closed it down. Right. Um, they couldn't find a way to d for Diem to launch in a way that satisfied regulators. There was just too much distrust and too much confusion. And so uh, the Diem project has been closed. The software still exists because it's open source software. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen is at least four different teams who have left Meta, left that world, and have started their own companies or their own projects using the DM software. So that's very interesting. Mm. Um, the head of the DM project at Facebook, David Marcus, has just announced that he has another company um, uh, which is going to be focusing on Bitcoin and the Lightning Network. So a completely different kind of technology stack, though yeah. still in the digital currency space. So very interesting to see that ultimately um, Diem, you know, they built a lot of really great technology and that tech will make it out into the world, but it will not be launching as Facebook's currency. Just to be clear, this is something very different from tokenization. Um, I think uh, I'm, I'm still trying to work out exactly how tokenization is going to present itself, but some of these large companies will issue tokens in the form of NFTs, I guess, and that that will allow you to participate not only in the product, but you know, in some sort of ownership of the company as well. Is, is that how you understand how this tokenization could work? Or? Tokenization is super interesting, and I think it's going to be incredibly impactful. I think the basic idea behind the word, when people say tokenization or mm -hmm. we're going to tokenize the economy, what they're really talking about is they're saying, you know, there's a lot of real world assets out there. There's dollars, there's gold, there's equities, there's bonds. And we want to think about taking those assets and making them compatible inside the blockchain universe. So inside the world of digital assets and cryptocurrencies, we're able to settle instantly, we're able to use um, tokens inside of smart contracts, mm -hmm. we're able to build all sorts of really interesting decentralized applications with them. But we can't do that with the stuff in the real world. And so part of it is taking that stuff in the real world and moving it into the blockchain world so that we can now uh, operate on this new set of rails mm. will, with these existing financial instruments. So that's, that's one big part of it. I think another big part of it is kind of what you were alluding to, which is um, NFTs or non-fungible tokens have really taken off over the last year. And we're seeing a lot of legacy companies start to think about NFTs and how they can be a part mm. of their brand and their marketing platform and a way 
for them to engage with their users and mm -hmm. with consumers. And so you see a lot of brands thinking, well, I create luxury goods. Uh, and so I'm going to create a digital luxury good to go along with my physical luxury goods. Because you know, when you think about where we're spending our time these days as people, so much of it is online, mm -hmm. so much of it is digital. Uh, you know, our Twitter stream and our Twitter like statistics matter more sometimes than what happens in the real world. And so it kind of makes sense that you want your brands and your luxury goods and, mm -hmm. and your art and everything to also exist natively in the digital world. And that's really what we're seeing with NFTs. Are you saying Twitter isn't the real world? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, um, uh, so what do you mean by just because I, I find examples much easier for me to, to understand. Like you say, um, a luxury company could, you could have an asset in the real world and a, and a, and a digital luxury product to go with it. Here's an example. Um, you could imagine that a handbag maker, for example, right. makes these like really beautiful handbags and you buy one and you can hold on to one and you know, it's really great. You carry it around. It's a, it's a, it's a great status symbol, but then they can also, also issue a limited edition set of digital goods, digital tokens, and you buy one and you might have, it might be a piece of artwork, it might be something made by an artist, it might be something that mirrors the handbag that you just bought. People are experimenting with all sorts of things, but you buy this and you have this digital object, this digital item, and you can display it in your wallet, mm -hmm. you can um, use it as your profile picture on Twitter, uh, you know, you can, you can just sort of share it with your friends, it's there in your wallet, uh, you can sell it. You can yeah. sell it, and, and there are lots of markets where people are trading these things. So I want to ask you about cryptocurrencies. Um, recently, over the last few months, we've had um, the situation with Terra and uh, Luna Classic, and I'm not as much of an expert in this world as you, so I'd, I'd love, as much as you can, just try to explain how this stable coin kind of lost its credibility, became unpegged to the single dollar, and, and eventually became valueless. Yeah, so I think it helps to start with stable coins and kind of what are stable coins and what are the different kinds. Um, so we've seen at least three different kinds of stable coins. So one kind of stable coin is what I'll call one-to-one -one backed. And that is um, an issuer. For example, um, Circle is a company in the United States that, issue, that creates a stable coin called USDC, uh, holds U.S. Treasuries and U.S. Dollars and issues a token, a stable coin USDC for every dollar. So if you want a USDC token, you come to Circle, you give them a dollar and they'll give you a USDC token and they promise. Each one collateralized by U.S. dollar in some exactly. bank account. In and very importantly, if you come to them with a USDC token, they'll can. give you a dollar back. You can take your dollar out and they're holding very safe, very liquid assets, treasuries and actual dollars. Uh, so those are one-to-one -one back stable coins. Then Sorry, can I just ask on yeah. that? So if you buy one of those stable coins, is there any yield on that coin? Usually, no, there is no yield on that coin just as it stands. However, because the person I, holding yeah. the dollars in the treasuries might be earning an interest rate on that in their mm -hmm. bank account or on the treasuries. They, so far, they don't usually pass that on to the consumer. So it's, it's more like you're holding cash that doesn't have uh, any sort of a yield. So that's one category, one-to-one -one backed. Another category, is algorithmic stable coins, mm -hmm. and that's where Terra sits. And these are really interesting because they aren't really backed at all. There's definitely not a big pile of dollars sitting behind them. Instead, there's an algorithm and a mechanism design that is trying to maintain the peg. So in the case of Terra, there's a corresponding asset called Luna. Mm. And the way that they try to maintain the peg is they say at any point in time, their stable coin is called UST. Uh, you can take one UST and you can exchange it for a dollar's worth of Luna. And so they kind of have this market around UST and around Luna, and it's supposed to maintain the peg because at any point in time, you could take your UST and you can get a dollar's worth of Luna out of it. Mm -hmm. Now, this sounds great in theory, but it doesn't always work in practice for a few different reasons. Uh, so first of all, um, okay, what if there's not enough Luna? Or what if the price of Luna tanks? Or right. um, you know, what if weird things are happening with the Luna market? Luna's just a random asset. It can go up, it can go down, yeah. highly volatile. Uh, another question is, who says what a dollar's worth of Luna is? How do they actually determine what that price is? Mm. Uh, and um, the actual exchange, I think, was happening on a blockchain. So then you've got the whole dynamics of the blockchain happening as well. So a lot of these little frictions, um, there's some fees involved if you actually want to do this. And what ended up happening with Terra and Luna is you saw what's called a death spiral. So the price of Luna was tanking, the UST broke the peg, and these things just sort of fed into each other 
mm -hmm. and um, consumers and, and holders of UST and Luna just lost faith that this was going to continue to be a viable right. exchange mecha mechanism. And ultimately, that's what a currency needs is credibility and, and, and yeah, trust. Yeah, it's actually kind of interesting because what they were trying to do is a lot like what central banks do mm. with their own native currencies. They um, So one thing uh, that's important to note is that the people behind Terra and Luna actually had a really large treasury of Bitcoin. Now, this Bitcoin wasn't backing UST. UST holders couldn't come and trade their UST for Bitcoin. But what they promised to do was they promised to perform open market operations to try to to try to keep the peg of UST. So if UST fell below a dollar, they promised to use their Bitcoin to buy UST to try to bring it back up. Um, and yeah. we saw them doing that during this crash. We saw them deploying vast amounts of Bitcoin uh, and it ultimately wasn't enough. Um, perhaps I'm being too theoretical about this, but you know, back in the day when you used to have one dollar, there was always you know, the same amount of gold backing it in the bank. And then that obviously broke in the 70s. And then what was backing it was basically a promise to pay you by the banks and then ultimately by the central bank, which was the ultimate sort of underwriter. Um, it just sounds a little similar, right? It sounds a little similar, right? It does sound a little similar. Yeah, yeah. It what, does sound a little similar. There was something physical backing it. And now it's just a promise that, you know, no credibility will be lost or there will be something coming to the rescue. And then it's just the final supporter of the collateral sort of, you know, evaporated. But... You know, it, it actually is really similar. I think that's what's so fascinating about it. And I think that's why we haven't seen the end of algorithmic stable coins by any means. Mm. It's just that Do Kwan and Luna and Terra and that whole ecosystem was way less credible and way less able to, to maintain right. stability than you know, your Federal Reserve yeah. or your European Central Bank, yeah. which, uh, which has spent a lot of time and effort building credibility and um, you know, really trying to, to do that carefully. And did you say there were three stable coins? Yeah, the third type, um, which uh, is backed, but not backed by dollars in the bank or treasuries and not backed by an algorithm, but instead over collateralized in a smart contract. So that's where we have things like DAI, D A I, mm. um, which is a token that is created by MakerDAO, a smart contract where people lock up collateral. So, and, and these are heavily over collateralized, 150%, 200%. You lock up your Ethereum or your Bitcoin and you mint uh, about half as much die as that's worth. And if it turns out that the price of Bitcoin or Ethereum falls, they'll liquidate it, sell it to cover the die. Right. So, um, so these are also a little bit algorithmic in that it's a smart contract controlling it, but heavily over collateralized. So a bit safer than your algorithmic stable coins. So as we look at, um, into the, the world of tokenization, what industries do you think it might start coming into first? Well, I think uh, we're, we're already seeing this um, securities and bonds. Mm. I mean, your usual sort of financial instruments. We are seeing some exchanges that are tokenizing uh, U.S. securities to make it easier to trade and to make uh, to make it easier to trade in different ways. So that's really interesting to see. Um, but you know, I think it's going to really infiltrate everywhere, and it it depends on how useful. Uh, what types of useful applications people build mm. using these assets. Yeah. So I think it's going to start, and it already is starting, with your typical financial instruments. Um, artwork, which is super interesting and very right. different than the finance industry. So watching people create digital art natively. But anything where there's a real sort of, it makes more sense to have a digitally native way of expressing the finances. I guess another really interesting place where we're seeing tokenization is in governance. So um, mm. we have these things called DAOs, which are decentralized mm. autonomous organizations. And um, people are self-organizing using them and they're using tokens to represent voting shares. Mm. And so a bunch of people get together, they assign tokens as voting or governance shares, and they use that to manage the assets of the DAO. Uh, yeah, I think I was reading that one of the DAOs was trying to put money together to try and buy, was it the first? The Constitution. New Constitution, the right. Constitution DAO, yes. Yeah. That was exciting to watch. Yes. Did you, were you watching that? I was watching it, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, who bought it in the end? I can't remember. I don't remember either, unfortunately. Uh, Ken Griffin, I think it was. Was it Ken Griffin? I think it was Ken Griffin. <laughs> um, so the last time, uh, again, the last time we spoke, we were talking a little bit about um, uh, the possibility for any kind of crime in the world of, of, of cryptocurrencies and can it be um, infiltrated? Um, how do you feel about the security issues in and around digital assets? 
There are so many things about the security of digital assets, and we're seeing, um, you know, you see really big things like the the Terra Luna sort of debacle and what happened with that. And I would actually argue that is a little bit about security as well. It's the underlying economic security of what mm. was built. Are the economics solid, um, or can they be taken advantage of? Can mm. someone cause a death spiral? Um, but we also see smart contracts getting hacked uh, for tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Um, so it's been really interesting to see those cybersecurity issues. Uh, when it comes to things like uh, uh, money laundering or, or, or anti-terrorism financing, I'm really impressed by the way that the industry has responded. People are taking this very seriously, and we've seen some really interesting technology develop by companies like Chainalysis or Elliptic yeah. that are doing a really great job of tracing these assets across blockchains. Um, so whenever there's you know something really crazy that happens, Chainalysis does an amazing analysis and, and goes over and says, we, we tracked the funds, we saw where they went, and that's part of the public nature of what these blockchains are. So uh, I'm very optimistic. I think that um, I think that these companies are really responding well and, and doing a good job of, of being able to track assets and make it easier to, to catch bad guys. So hypothetically, Neha, what if somebody managed to, in inverted commas, crack the code and uh, could go into some kind of, let's say, trading platform and manage to um, basically withdraw an enormous amount of money uh, and then refuse to give it back? What what sort of ethical, um, uh, what sort of, how, how ethically would that, would you see that playing out? You know, that's a really interesting question. And there are multiple factors at play here. So first of all, you got to ask the question, in which jurisdiction was this happening, right? Is this in the United States? Is it subject to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act um, or the, you know, or, you know, some other laws that govern, you know, how that code could have been accessed? Did the person accessing it sign a terms of service that said that they weren't supposed to access it that way. Mm. So you know, you've got the actual law and jurisdictions of wherever this happened, where the company was domiciled, where the user was. Unfortunately, oftentimes these days, those are crossing boundaries, so that can get quite complex. Um, I think the way that I approach it is, Look, if whoever was running the smart contract, and let's be clear, it was an insecure smart contract if someone was able to do this, if they claim to be decentralized, if they claim that, you know, that, that this is a decentralized smart contract, that we're putting this code up here and there's no one controlling it, there's no one, you know, in charge of it, and the code, you know, the code is here and you know, they claim that as part of their value proposition. Mm -hmm. Well then I say if someone hacks it, you know, that, great for the hacker. You know, they, they found they found a bug and they took advantage of it and better that it happened earlier than when that mm -hmm. application was 10 times the size and had 10 times as much money to lose. Right. So, um, you know, I but but of course, you, you know, it's not just in this world of smart contracts and decentralizations and code is law. Code is not actually law. <laughs> law is law. <laughs> I was going to say, so it's, it's not clear whether that person has committed a crime. Exactly, or, exactly, exactly. And so I think first and foremost is you got to go with the law of the land, right? And and that's going to what ultimately win that that will win at the end of the day is you know did this person actually violate any laws or not, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you know assuming they didn't, assuming they didn't violate any laws, then I would I would you know in terms of thinking about it from an ethics standpoint, I would take a look at whoever put that smart contract up, whoever authored it, and I would look at the claims that they were making. Mm -hmm. And you know if they put up a smart contract with buggy code and they allowed it to grow to a point where it had millions of dollars in it mm -hmm. and they didn't pay to secure it properly, um, you know, that's kind of on them. And so if you look out into the future, um, I know it's a kind of impossible question, but is it, do you have more clarification now or can you see more clearly when do you think we'll have a, a digital dollar in the US? Oh, that's a that's a hard question to answer. Um, so another thing that happened since the last time we talked is Biden issued an executive order on digital assets, uh, and in that executive order, he instructed uh, various agencies to write. Oh gosh, about a dozen different reports, right. and a couple of those reports are do cover the topic of central bank digital currency in the United States. So the Treasury is writing a report on uh, the future of payments in the United States, mm -hmm. and the Office of Science and Technology Policy is writing a report on the underlying infrastructure behind a central bank digital currency. I'm definitely going to be keeping an eye on those reports to see what they say. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that there's any reason to rush uh, in the United States. I think there's a reason to rush to research and to build capacity mm -hmm. and to build talent, but there isn't a rush to launch. 
you know, we can take our time. The dollar is very important <laughs> globally. Right. And, uh, you know, this isn't something that you want to necessarily get into lightly. No, they've got to get it right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, Neha, as, as ever, it's such a, a fantastic uh, conversation with you. And I want to thank you so much for your insights. Thank you so much, Jamie, for having me. It's been great.